And uh, thank you, Donna, and thank you to the Center for inviting me. My name is Evan Weiner. I have been doing uh, this kind of thing since 1971. I was on radio at the age of 15 at a station about 35 miles north of Manhattan, WRKL. I was in 11th grade, Spring Valley High School in Rockland County, and my teacher, Mr. Dionisio, Joe Dionisio, came up to me. He said, student, you have a good voice. How would you like to be on radio? I said, I want to do it in the worst way. And I did. It was a high school show, and it was bad. But that was the start of my career. And uh, I still speak to Joe Dionisio 49 years later, and he still calls me student. He also opened the door for me to write at uh, the Nyack Journal News and the Bergen Record. And within six and a half years after I graduated college at the age of 21, I was on 50,000 watts worth of WNEW AM radio in New York. Uh, they played Sinatra and Nat King Cole and all that. And uh, I was doing some news for them, thanks to John Lindsay, the former mayor of New York, who told me at the age of 21, I'm running for Senate for New York. And uh, WNEW called me, we'd like to buy that tape from you. I said, how much are you going to pay me? 10 bucks sold. And three and a half years. Um, among the people I interviewed on WNEW, uh, Congressman Jack Kemp, presidential candidate Ronald Reagan, presidential candidate Ted Kennedy, and a whole bunch of others. And uh, that's uh, where I started my career. Uh, that, of course, is John Elway. I want to get on everybody's good side here in Denver. Uh, this is the first time I'm talking to a Colorado audience. And this was an NFL outing. And he's there with my father-in-law, who was a major groupie. He used to come around with me and, um, and take pictures of, of athletes like Elway. Because... Uh, um, because you're probably going to get upset at me with the next slide because it is Phil Sims and it is me. And that's 1982 when Phil Sims was the quarterback of the New York Giants. He was the MVP of the Super Bowl. And um, I don't know if I should say this or not because there are Broncos fans in here. And this is my first time ever speaking to you. But uh, yeah, Phil Sims and the Giants beat the Denver Broncos in 1987 and uh, they won the Super Bowl. Uh, but we're talking about the Super Bowl, which is much more than a game. It's an event, and it's a happening, and uh, it's serious business. Um, it's not just a game. The Super Bowl was created after the United States Congress passed legislation which allowed the mergers of the American Football League, of which Denver was a member, and the National Football Leagues. The merger was tacked on to an anti-inflation bill which was signed into law by the president, Lyndon Johnson, November 8th, 1966. Now, before I get into the Super Bowl and everything else around the Super Bowl, these are your ta tax dollars at work. Uh, the security for the Super Bowl is among the highest for any event in the United States. In fact, it's the second highest, only behind the, uh, the presidential inaugural every four years. Super Bowl is a special events assessment rating level one event. There are 50 agencies who have been working for a year and a half or generally work for a year and a half before a game. Uh, but in Florida's case, the Super Bowl was in South Florida last year and in Tampa this year on Sunday. Um, so people have been on the ground for two and a half years to make sure that event was safe and this one on Sunday is safe. Uh, there is no word on how much it costs taxpayers to provide security. The NFL and the ownership doesn't pay any money to help secure the event. Uh, the FBI, FEMA, TSA, Customs and Border Patrol, Local police, this case Tampa. Turn the probably. sound off on both phones, okay? okay. Uh, let me just mute, mute everybody. Okay, there you go. Uh, that's my fault. Uh, the NFL does not pay any money to help secure the event. Uh, the FBI, FEMA, TSA, Customs and Border Patrol, uh, the local police, Tampa, Hillsbury County, Hillsborough County, Florida, probably Pinellas County uh, across the bay in Tampa, and probably Polk County east of Tampa, all part of uh, the security staff along with the Florida State Troopers. So this is a very secure event. Um, but the Super Bowl, Super Bowl comes about partially by accident and partially because of this event. You're taking a look at uh, some of the American Football League All-Stars from 1964. Goose Goslin was part of that All-Star team with the Denver Broncos. Uh, you're looking at uh, Butch Berg to the right. 
uh, with the Buffalo Bills, Earl Faison uh, with the Fedora back there. Uh, I'm not sure who this player is. His hand is over his face and his ear, and he's got glasses on. Uh, Curtis McClinton, who played with the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, is holding what looks to be plane tickets. And that's exactly what he is holding, plane tickets, because these guys decided to boycott the 1965 All-Star Game in New Orleans. Uh, the AFL, uh, which was founded in 1959, started play in 1960, which included the Denver Broncos. Uh, the AFL was looking to expand. Lamar Hunt, uh, who founded the league in 1959, and Bud Adams, who also was one of the co-founders in 1959, the Houston Oilers owner. And they were looking for an expansion city, and they thought they found one in New Orleans. Dave Dixon was the business leader who uh, invited them down to New Orleans, along with the governor of the state and the mayor of New Orleans, and they were going to welcome these guys with open arms. But as the poet once said, uh, the best laid plants of mice and men always go awry. A quick background, how this thing started. Well, Civil Rights Act of 1964, Jim Crow, New Orleans, a player's boycott. Senator Russell Long, Representative Hale Box, Cokie Roberts' father, Cokie Roberts, who uh, was on NPR and ABC, the late Cokie Roberts. Representative Emanuel Seller from Brooklyn, New York, all part of the Super Bowl creation, both by accident and design. Uh, about seven years ago, I gave Ron Mix a call. Ron Mix uh, was, uh, is a Hall of Fame player. He played with the Los Angeles slash San Diego Chargers in the American Football League from 1960 to 69, and then played with the Chargers and the uh, Raiders when they got into the NFL, those teams, in 1970-71. And uh, I gave him a call about seven years ago, and this is when uh, Donald Sterling owned the uh, Los Angeles Clippers of the National Basketball Association. And uh, he told his mistress, hey, listen, uh, don't bring black guys to our games. I don't want you to do that. She leaked it to TMZ. And um, the players heard it on the Los Angeles Clippers and said uh, they were going on strike, that they refused to play in the playoffs, NBA playoffs, for Donald Sterling. Uh, within three days, all the advertisers, marketing partners pulled out of deals with the Los Angeles Clippers and the uh, NBA stripped. Uh, sterling of his uh, ownership of the franchise. Uh, Mix was part of the boycott back in 1965. So I called him, I've known him for a while, and I said, hey, tell me the difference between what you went through in New Orleans and what's going on in Los Angeles. And he said, it's simple. What's going on in Los Angeles is a team matter. Us, we were fighting for something. We were fighting for civil rights. Um, we were aware that New Orleans was hosting the game, this is Ron Mix talking, to demonstrate to the American Football League and the National Football League they, New Orleans, could support the football franchise. The last thing we wanted to do was a system in demonstrating they could support the franchise. A boycott was the only alternative for the players. No, games in, no game in New Orleans, no American Football League game in New Orleans, the All-Star game. Uh, and no AFL team for New Orleans. Uh, but it wasn't the first boycott or first planned protest ever in New Orleans. Uh, back in 1961, Walter Beach was with the American Football League's Boston Patriots. And um, he had signed with the Patriots. He got out of Central Michigan University, a place I spoke at in 1999, signs with the Boston Patriots there in 1960. 1961, Patriots scheduled to play a preseason game in New Orleans. And Walter Beach tells Mike Holovac and Billy Sullivan, Billy Sullivan, the owner of the Patriots, uh, I'm a football player. I'm going down there. It's a preseason game. I'm down there. It's all business. None of this Green Book stuff. I don't want any of the Green Book stuff. I don't want to spend time with a host family. I don't want to take transportation to a seedy side of town. I don't want to eat in seedy restaurants or somebody's uh, dining room. I want to be with my teammates. I am, I am a football player. It's all I am. Well, uh, Walter Beach was talking to the other black players uh, with the uh, Boston Patriots, and uh, he's organizing them for some sort of protest. This is only going to be, we're going down there the day before, 
staying at a hotel, playing the game, and going right back to Boston. So it's a quick thing. Uh, Billy Sullivan and Mike Holoback didn't like what Walter Beach was proposing, and they labeled him a troublemaker because he organized the protest among the black players against the segregated living conditions during the team's 36-hour road trip in New Orleans. Uh, he's cut, gone. He resurfaces with the Cleveland Browns, plays with them, uh, with their championship team in 1964. And uh, he was a civil rights leader in sports, continued that, when Muhammad Ali was stripped of his uh, boxing title and his boxing license after refusing to uh, be inducted into the United States military back in uh, April of 1967. Beach was part of a group called the Cleveland Summit with Jim Brown, my buddy uh, Flea Roberts, Walt Flea Roberts, and a very young Lou Alcindor talking to Ali to see if he was legit in his conscientious objective status. He was legit and they backed him and helped him out financially and other, in other ways. So Beach was around. Cookie Gilchrist, you might remember him because he wore number two with the Broncos at the end of his career. Uh, but he was with the Buffalo Bills back in 1965. And uh, he was one of the vocal leaders of why there should be a boycott. Although in Cookie's case, it really wasn't all that bad for him. He was able to get a cab from the airport to his hotel because he was in a cab with Jack Kemp. And Jim Crow custom uh, in New Orleans was a colored man could not get into a cab. But if he was with a white man and the white man is sponsoring him, he could take a cab with the white men. White men would be responsible and he was able to hail a cab. His teammates, most of them, could not get a cab ride from the airport to either the Hotel Roosevelt or the Fountain Blue Hotel. Uh, the New Orleans business leaders led by Dave Dixon, who was the guy who founded the United States Football League in 1981. You might remember the Denver Gold of the USFL back in 1983. That was uh, one of Dixon's creations. Anyway, he was uh, a business leader in New Orleans, and he was the one pushing to get the game, uh, the All-Star game, and a team in New Orleans pushing the AFL. Uh, the leaders of the city, Dixon, other business leaders, the mayor of New Orleans and the governor of Louisiana said, hey, come on down. We understand you have 22 black players. They're going to be greeted with open arms. Segregation, thing of the past. Jim Crow, that's thing of the past. Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act into law in last July. And we want a football team. We desperately want a football team. And the AFL is like, yeah, that'd be cool. We'll get a football team in New Orleans. That works out well for us. And one thing about the AFL, which I have to explain, is that uh, black players and white players were equal on the field. And in fact, you take a look at this uh, all-star game uh, program from just two years earlier, and you can see that uh, you have Earl Faison on there, you have Fred the Hammer Williamson on there, you got Earl Faison, African-American players, and you got white players too. Because back in the 1960s, the American Football League truly was the only league to embrace African-American athletes as an equal on the field to white players. The National Football League had a quota of four players, four Negro players per team. Uh, you might remember Irv Cross from the uh, CBS to NFL Today show. Uh, we've been old pals for a long time, and I was checking with him uh, after the COVID outbreak. Uh, he's up in Minneapolis. Just see how he was doing. He was doing fine. He said, what you been up to? I said, well, I'm doing the Super Bowl talk. This is last March, April. And um, I was talking about the, the boycott and how there was a quota of uh, players, Negro players in the NFL. He said, hold on, hold on. He said, 1961, my first year, let's see, four. You said four per team? He said, there was me, there was Tim Brown, Ted Dean, and Clarence Peaks. There you go. We got our four. Four. And most teams had four at that time. But the AFL had more than four guys on some particular teams. Uh, the NFL, they went to watch players from the big-time schools, the Big Ten and other conferences uh, in, the, in the South particularly. Uh, the AFL looked for players with a different background, like Grambling in Louisiana, North Carolina, A&T, Bethune-Cookman in Florida, Prairie View in Texas, Texas A&I, uh, Morgan State University in Baltimore in Maryland. So they went looking 
four players in, histor in the traditional historic black colleges. Um, and and they, found a, they found a lot of really good players there. They also were looking for player, four players from the Canadian Football League, like Frank Tripuca, uh, Don Maynard, who ended up with the Jets, uh, or just two of them, then George Blander, who was uh, retired for a year, came out of retirement to play for Houston. They were just looking for players starting in 1959. They didn't care the background of any players. They just wanted players on the field. Ironically, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 destroyed the black college football programs as the best players could attend the big schools like Alabama with Bear Bryant or the University of Texas with Darrell Royal or Old Miss or Louisiana State or Georgia or Tennessee or Arkansas or Oklahoma or North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Florida, Florida State, University of Miami. All the best players went to the football factories and it literally destroyed all of the black college football programs or you know, the quality of the programs. That's my friend Abner Haynes. He played with the Dallas Texans, team that moved to Kansas City in 1963. And uh, a number of years ago, Abner said, I think I want to write a biography. Do you want to um, help me out? I said, no, you know, I'm not that kind of writer. You'd be better served with somebody else. I'm a short, choppy writer. I could write a precise 40 seconds. Uh, I could put 800 words precisely together, but a long form biography that's not for me. Uh, Abner Haynes was uh, in uh, New Orleans and he was told by the owner of the Kansas City Chiefs uh, where he's playing, he and David Grayson, hey, this is it, name, rank, and serial number. Abner Haynes, running back Kansas City Chiefs, member of the American Football League All-Star team. Abner was the first African-American to regularly play college football in Texas with North Texas University in 1956. Uh, what is following here is some of the stories that Abner told me, and this one happens to be about New Orleans. And he was talking about he and David Grace, and they're waiting at the airport. They have to wait three and a half hours for uh, a cab to pick them up to take them to the game. They saw their white teammates say, hey, get in a cab, no problem. Gilchrist hitched the ride with Jack Kemp. And uh, so Abner is waiting with his teammates and uh, waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, somebody gets a call out to Bud Adams, the Houston Oilers owner, and says, hey, the black guys are all at the airport. They can't get a ride. Um, immediately, Adams makes a phone call to the governor of Louisiana and then to the uh, mayor of New Orleans saying, hey, what's going on here? My guys can't get to the hotels. Uh, well, um, the governor sent out the colored cabs for the colored players, and they ended up going there. Uh, Abner gets to the Roosevelt Hotel with David Grayson, and uh, they check in. There's not a problem, but they go to the elevator. And uh, it was one of these old hand-cranked elevators, right, um, that uh, opened up, and there was a fence there, and somebody sitting there and working the crank back and forth. And uh, the woman looks at them, uh, an elderly white woman, as uh, Abner said. And so she looks at them and she says, hey, monkeys, what are you doing here? The rest is Abner. Um, they had a woman operating the elevator and she said, you monkeys, come on in, get to the back. Finally, we had about 10 or 12 guys in my room. We were talking sensibly. We were going to stay together. This was just another test. Some of the stories, players get yelled at, names, they're called names and all. Some players cannot eat with their teammates because they're black uh, in restaurants. Um, others like um, Earl Faison and Ernie Ladd and Dick Westmoreland, all of the San Diego Chargers, attempt to go into a bar. And hey, it's Bourbon Street, that's what you do. And uh, there's a, a guy, a little guy, maybe five foot eight, saying, I wouldn't come in here if I were you. Well, we're coming in. <laughs> I wouldn't come in here if I were you. I'm telling you that. And Ernie Ladd and the others come in, and this guy's got a gun, and he's ready to use it on the players. They flee. So this stuff is going on, and these guys start talking and talking and talking about what is happening. And they tell Jack Kemp, it's going to be us only, us 22 only. You stay away. Jack Kemp, who is the Buffalo Bills quarterback, 
the head or actually the president of the American Football League Players Association says, okay, do what you have to do. Abner, this was just another test. We had no leverage. We weren't playing for money, but we were playing for progress. Football players took the lead. I stopped in there and said, well, what about Randolph with FDR back in 41? Or what about W.E.B. Uh, du Bois? And what about Rosa Parks? And he said, I'm talking about football players. Yeah, football players like, uh, well, like uh, Beach back in 1961, uh, Walter Beach. Places like Atlanta, New Orleans, Miami were death holes. Dave Grayson could get a drink at the bar. Our white teammates in New Orleans were there for us. Guys like Kim, Jack Kemp. That was 1979. That's in Spark Hill, New York. I'm 23 years old, and Jack Kemp is uh, laying the groundwork to run for president in 1980. And um, that's when I first met Jack. We had a very long relationship uh, while he was in Congress, while he was a private citizen. And... Um, we talked about what happened in New Orleans also. And in that particular picture, 1979, it was, uh, I don't know who took it. It was a newspaper I wrote for. I don't remember who took it, but the Jack got ended up in, in there by himself. But the photographer figured, hey, you might want this as a keepsake. And Jack, a years later, saw the picture, said, what happened to your hair? He said, what happened to your wig? It was brown in those days. 2003, that's my son. We're at the Arizona Biltmore at an NFL function, and that's Jack Kemp with his particular wig. Jack gave my son, who was 17 years old at the time, his first legal bar drink. I said, Jack, he's underage. He said, shut up. What do you want? I said, Jack, he's underage. He said, what do you want, too? <laughs> he looked at me. He said, come on. <laughs> he said, what do you want? Jack gave my son, who was underage at the time, his first drink at a bar, Jack Kemp. Uh, one of the things we needed, the unity of the white players and the black players for a new league. When the white players, Jack Kemp, Jerry Mays, who was our Kansas City Chiefs defensive leader, or four or five other guys, heard about what was happening, their character showed, and my teammates were looking after me. Uh, the players voted to, and they didn't take any notes or anything, so some of the people you talk to, you, based on memory, uh, and all those years ago, some of the memories, although this was done 10 years ago, some of the memories had faded by that point. But uh, the players voted to boycott. They're gone. They go back home. They would regroup two days later and play the All-Star game in Houston. Dave Dixon was really, really, really upset about all of this. He wanted the team in New Orleans, and he told the New York Times the boycotters had unjustly sullied New Orleans' reputation, complaining their militant action would not only damage the city, but would greatly retard efforts by men of goodwill of both races to achieve harmony. New Orleans is on the outside looking in, and you would never think that because New Orleans is on the outside looking in, that would be the linchpin for the Super Bowl. Um, so New Orleans doesn't have a team. Eventually, New Orleans would become a political pawn, and the Super Bowl would rise out of the ashes of the New Orleans boycott. The American Football League and the National Football League decided to get married. That was on June 8th, 1966. But, you know, you've got to get permission in some cases from somebody, your parents or somebody else, you know, if you're young. And certainly the American Football League was young. It was only six years old at the time, not even seven. Uh, and it was marrying uh, an entity that was 46 years old. But uh, this all happens after the Kansas City Chiefs owner, Lamar Hunt, who founded the AFL, and Texas E. Schramm, the general manager and window washer and whatever else he did of the Dallas Cowboys, one of the things that he did was give the Cowboys the nickname America's Team, which if you're in the New York market or if you're in the Philadelphia market or the Washington market, when I say that, uh, people are not very happy when I say that. Uh, they don't consider Dallas America's team. In fact, they think Dallas Cowboys around here, that's the ultimate enemy. Um, but the two meet at Love Field in Dallas under the Lone Ranger statue. And the two of them get together and work out a deal to merge the two leagues. But uh, they knew that uh, they couldn't just do it. They just couldn't announce it because they would have to get an antitrust exemption from Congress and uh, 
there was only one man who could do it. By the way, Love Field is where they took Ken John F. Kennedy's body after his assassinated in Dallas, Love Field, Dallas, back to Washington uh, on November 22nd, 1963. So there's only one man that the NFL and the AFL trust to get the merger done in Congress, and that's him, Pete Rozelle, Elvin Pete Rozelle, Elvin Roy Pete Rozelle, uh, and that is him, that is me, 1986, on the uh, courthouse steps of the Southern District of New York, Foley Square, Richard Nixon's office was across the street from there, and that was the USFL-NFL uh, trial. Amazing how things come full circle. Roselle and Dixon are on opposite sides here again. But anyway, to make a long story even longer, Roselle has to go to Washington. And uh, he has to uh, get this thing done, and he has to lobby the House, and he's got to lobby the Senate. Uh, but he's an old hand at this because the sports commissioner is a hardened political uh, lobbyist. And Roselle uh, has, knew his way around Capitol Hill by the summer of 1966. In fact, in 1961, Roselle lobbied the House and the Brooklyn Democrat, Emanuel Seller, in an attempt to win a limited antitrust exemption so the NFL could sell its 14 franchises as one entity to a television network. Now, the Denver Broncos and the other seven teams in 1960 and 61 in the AFL split television money eight ways. Uh, they were able to do it because they were a new startup league flying under the radar. Major League Baseball could do it. They had a blanket antitrust exemption back from 1922, so they could sell the 16 teams in 1959, then the uh, 16, or rather the 16 teams in 59, 60, 18 teams in 61, and 20 teams in 62 as one to a network. And there were only two networks that mattered in those days, CBS and NBC. ABC was half a network. By the way, the guy who brokered the original American Football League deal with uh, ABC TV was a guy named Jay Michaels. And you might know his son because his son believes in miracles, USA Hockey, 1980. His son, Alan, Alan Michaels, is the Sunday night football announcer. Al Michaels started his career with his mother for Monty Hall on Let's Make a Deal. It wasn't that much of a stretch. His father was in TV. And then he was, he was doing something like giving tickets out to Let's Make a Deal. And then he made it up to the dating game where he was the guy who put together the bachelorettes and the bachelor. And then he got into uh, sports broadcasting. The Sports Broadcast Act of 1961, signed into law by John Kennedy, September 30th of that year, allowed the NFL to bundle the 14 franchises, sell it as one to a TV network, either CBS or NBC back in those days. And it would allow the New York Giants to get the same TV money as the Green Bay Packers. Uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers get the same money in the Chicago Bears. The law helped propel the NFL into a different economic orbit. Two of the three men responsible for the Super Bowl, Russell Long on the left, Louisiana Democrat, fifth most powerful senator in 1966, and the President Lyndon Johnson. Uh, neither the Louisiana Democrat, Long, who was the Senate's majority whip and chairman of the Senate Financial Committee, nor Hale Boggs. Louisiana congressmen were very excited about this planned football merger. After all, uh, New Orleans didn't have a team, and they didn't see any benefit uh, for the city of New Orleans, and why should they support it? And with Long, there's another senator in Louisiana, and two senators in Mississippi, and two in Alabama, and two in Tennessee, and two in Oklahoma, two in Arkansas. Hey, that starts adding up, and we got to get support for this thing. The other thing, Boggs, you could say the same thing about him in the House. Boggs was a powerful member of the House, and they told Pete Rozelle, uh, why can't we have a team? And Rozelle said, well, there's not enough talent. There are 24 teams around. Uh, they got nine, being the AFL. Miami took New Orleans' place as an expansion team. We got 15, 24, 24 teams. There's not enough talent for 24 teams, much less the 25th team. And Long and Boggs told Roselle, well, we feel your pain, but uh, no can do. Uh, but there are complications here. Um, the New York Jets become a complication because Emanuel Seller back in 1961 did Roselle a solid favor 
And, um, you know, you do something in Congress, it could become undone rather quickly if you cross the wrong person. Emanuel Seller had been in Congress since the War of 1812, well, 1920. So he was there 44 years at that point. He's in Brooklyn, and the next district over is where the Jets play, Shea Stadium in Queens. And there are a lot of people in Brooklyn who could not get tickets to New York Giants games but the Jets now have Joe Namath. They're playing in the new stadium uh, over by the World's Fair, sharing it with the New York Mets, Shea Stadium. It's easy to drive from Brooklyn. 10,000 seats or 10,000 uh, cars could be parked there. Uh, you could take the subway there. You could take a bus there. And Seller knows that he, some of his constituents are going to Jets games. And the Jets also have Joe Namath. Joe Namath is a good looking guy. Um, He's, you know, he's a man about town in Manhattan, and he wants to eventually be an actor. Uh, so the NFL plots, and the plot is something like this. We're going to satisfy the Louisiana interest because we really don't want 24 teams in 22 cities. We don't want two teams in New York. We don't want two teams in San Francisco, Oakland, the Bay Area. Uh, so we're going to do this. They got Namath. Hey, Namath is box office. And, you know, Sonny Werblin, who owned the Jets, he was once Elizabeth Taylor's PR guy. And he worked for MCA. MCA provided programming to David Sarnoff over at NBC. So he knows his way around TV. So let's send him to Hollywood. Um, it was uh, Werblin who got the big deal from Sarnoff in 1964. $35 million over five years, $7 million a year, which, mean, which meant every owner got nearly uh, $900,000 a year to invest in the franchise, including Denver. And uh, Worldwind signed Namath and John Hewitt and a whole bunch of others with that money. Uh, so let's move him to Los Angeles. We'll see if we can get him to do that. And Daniel Reeves, we'll throw some money his way, and he'll take his Rams down to San Diego. They'll replace the Chargers. And uh, Baron Hilton, well, you know what? We can move the Chargers franchise, uh, his franchise, to New Orleans. He, he, after all, he's got business interests there. He's got a hotel. And uh, Oakland Raiders, well, um, well, we'll move them to Seattle or Portland. We'll kind of figure that out, but we'll figure that out down the road. Let's get this done. Uh, Roselle runs this by Emanuel Seller. No can do. Seller is not going to do it. Uh, Seller and the Subcommittee on Antitrust uh, were assured by Roselle that no teams would move because of the merger, although after 1970, if a stadium did not seat more than 50,000, a team could move including the Chicago Bears, but they did move from Wrigley Field to Soldier Field in Chicago, and the Minnesota Vikings were in that category as well. Uh, New Orleans would get a team eventually. Two years ago, I was down at Mardi Gras, the fire truck crew, uh, 2019 Hot Nuts Screw Debt. That's the uh, play that uh, New Orleans fans thought. Kept them from going to the 2019 Super Bowl, pass interference not called on that play. Um, and uh, they were very upset. Even during Mardi Gras, they were very, very upset with all of that. Roselle and the NFL owners would relent. They would work out the deal with Hale Box that include placing a team in New Orleans. Congress approves the AFL-NFL merger, giving the two competitors an antitrust exemption. That was added on as a rider to an anti-inflation bill. What congressman, which senator is going to vote for inflation? Oh, yeah, I like that. I want to see inflation. That's, that's all good. Uh, so this thing basically was on a rocket ship to Lyndon Johnson's office. That happened October 21st, 1966. The NFL said, well, we'll do it 10 days later. Do it, adding the team in New Orleans. But 10 days later is Halloween. Now nah, you're not going to start the team on Halloween. A better date, we'll start it on All Saints Day. That's a letter from um, the owner of the uh, Detroit Lions, William Clay Ford, to the Honorable Gerald R. Ford, Jr., House of Representatives, Washington, D.C., a sincere thank you for your assistance in bringing about congressional approval of the NFL-AFL merger. The passage of this bill will now allow merger plans to go ahead full speed. Uh, important also is that the first championship game between the two leagues will now be played in January. Hale Boggs. Hale Boggs is the guy. 
Uh, so everything is in place for the Super Bowl. The NFL does give John Meekham the franchise in New Orleans, November 1st, 1966. Johnson signs public law 89-800, the Suspension of Credit Act, which carried a rider approving the merger of the National Football League and the American Football League on November 8th, 1966. And it's on to the Super Bowl. Oh, before I get to the Super Bowl, you got to remember the NFL is what the NFL is. The NFL pocketed an $8 million expansion fee from the New Orleans owner, John Meekham, which was split between the 15 owners. Additionally, the New York Jets ownership, Sonny Warblin, Phil Island, Leon Hess, had to pay $10 million to the New York Giants ownership because in 1960, Harry Wismer, uh, invaded the New York Territory. The Oakland Raiders handed over $8 million to the San Francisco 49ers. They invade uh, the San Francisco Territory in 1960. The AFL decided to hand over $7.5 million it received from Cincinnati as an expansion fee uh, for a team in Cincinnati. So the NFL owners came out with about a $900,000 profit. Uh, the New York Giants ownership close to 11 million, Oakland close to 9 million back in 1966. Both uh, Jets and Raiders ownership voted against the merger. They thought the AFL could make it on their own. Uh, it's all about money. And uh, the NFL owners made a lot of money on this merger. Hey, here's a question for you. Did Vince Lombardi, did Vince Lombardi ever win a Super Bowl? Yes or two Super Bowls? Yes or no? You can put the answer in the uh, chat box. I'll wait for a minute. And if you don't feel like doing that, uh, I will uh, give you the answer in five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Well, the answer is he never won a Super Bowl or two Super Bowls. He won the American Football League, National Football League World Championship game on January 15th, 1967 in Los Angeles. Uh, Green Bay and Kansas City played in that first game. Green Bay won 35 to 10. The Green Bay coach, Vince Lombardi, didn't want to play in the game. His team had already won the NFL championship and referred to the AFL. And Donna, this is your, your people, uh, your, your relatives bought into the AFL. He called it a Mickey Mouse League. What I never understood about the Mickey Mouse put down. It's put down. You know, that's a Mickey Mouse thing. Oh, that's so Mickey Mouse and all that other stuff. Uh, and, and Wayne Gretzky called the New Jersey Devils hockey team after the team moved from Denver to New Jersey a Mickey Mouse organization. Like, it's a rinky-dink, two-bit thing. Hey, you know how much that rodent is worth? I mean, the, the house the mouse built, D Disney, that thing is worth at least $66 billion. Comcast tried to uh, a hostile takeover of Disney about 15 years ago for $66 billion. The Disney people raised $66 billion to keep the Mickey Mouse operation. Disney, I never understood it, and for the life of me, I never will. A lot of empty seats in L.A. for that first game. Uh, L.A. is an event town, the Academy Awards, big previews for movies, and all that other stuff, entertainment town, it's a big, big deal. Dodgers, of course, a big deal. The Lakers, always a big deal in the NBA. Um, but somehow the first game here isn't a big deal. 94,000 seat Los Angeles Coliseum. Ticket price is just 12, six and 10 bucks. Six bucks to see a championship game. 33,000 empty seats. The last time a Super Bowl or the world championship game was not a sellout. Oh, the pride of CBS, Vince Lombardi, who had won the NFL championship, is now playing for the pride of uh, Walter Cronkite. Uh, he's playing for the pride of Eric Severide and playing for the pride of Mike Wallace and Ed Sullivan and Lucy and Red Skelton and Gilligan. Of course, Gilligan, can't forget Gilligan. Uh, and also Mr. Ed and Arnold the Pig. Uh, he's playing for the pride of uh, Goober Pyle and Gomer Pyle. Uh, and the Bradley girls over at Petticoat Junction, they're playing for that pride. That's the pride. Lombardi's feeling heat. Uh, the first game played uh, on January 15th, which is 26 days after all the T's were crossed and the I's dotted between the NFL and the AFL. Uh, CBS and NBC used the same television feed, but different announcers, different advertisers. The CBS chairman, Bill Paley, who founded CBS back in 1927 with a radio station in Philadelphia, WCAU, 
leaned on Lombardi because Lombardi's coaching for CBS's pride. You better win the game for Ed Sullivan. Unfortunately, while Bill Paley is leaning on Lombardi, and while David Sarnoff thinks this is a big deal at NBC, he found it NBC uh, in 1926, and actually is the father of modern radio in the United States. Unfortunately, both TV networks didn't think all that highly of the game because they taped the game and didn't bother to save it. Uh, NBC probably sent the tapes to Hollywood and said, oh, Hollywood Squares, you could tape over with Hollywood Squares. That's not a problem. Uh, and CBS, oh, we need for the edge of night, we need tapes. Here, here are the tapes. No complete copies of the game have surfaced in the past 54 years, which is unfortunate. Uh, ten, about seven, eight, nine years ago, the NFL put up a $10 million reward for anybody, no questions asked, if you had the uh, videos we're interested because the NFL in its thinking, well, maybe somebody in the Philippines or in South Korea or in Vietnam or in Germany where they were at that time uh, because the type, tapes were bicycled out there uh, so the soldiers could see the game. Maybe, just maybe, somebody stuffed it into a duffel bag, snuck it home, put it in their attic and forgot about it. Um, that didn't happen. Uh, none of the tapes have ever surfaced. There have been pieces of tapes from that first game. Uh, you could stitch it together with NFL films, the video, and also uh, the audio from radio, and that's what you got. So the game is still out there, but the original game was not preserved because back in those days, like Sherry Lewis, you might remember Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop, um, all of her tapes uh, on NBC uh, were raced over and used for the political conventions of 1964. Uh, Jerry Kramer, Jerry Kramer with the Green Bay Packers. I keep all of my interviews. They're all on things like this now from the original tape source. Uh, so in 1988, I spoke to Jerry Kramer at a, at a function and we were talking about that first game. I was talking to Frank Gifford. This is Kramer speaking. I was talking to Frank Gifford years ago, and he mentioned that he announced the first Super Bowl. Gifford said he was fairly cool, fairly calm, and relaxed, and he went over to put his arm around Vince's shoulder, and Lombardi shaking like a leaf. Gifford was Lombardi's favorite player of all time. Lombardi coached him when he was the offensive coordinator, although that position didn't exist in the 1950s, uh, with the New York Giants. Uh, Kramer again. Gifford said, that really made me nervous. Gifford, of course, was a CBS announcer, represented the NFL, and Lombardi was playing for him in his pride. Unlike when Gifford won the 1956 championship with his Giants teammates for offensive coach Lombardi. Money, money, money. Money is always the case in the NFL. CBS and NBC charged $42,000 for a 30-second commercial. The two networks paid $9.5 million to televise the game, more money going to the owners. The leagues couldn't even agree on which ball to use. When Green Bay was on offense, they used the Wilson Duke football, the Duke named after the Giants owner Wellington Merritt, or the Duke of Wellington. Uh, when Kansas City had the ball, they used the AFL-sanctioned Spalding J5V. Rivals, big rivals. Uh, Ford owned the Detroit Lions, two of the big three car makers, Ford against Chrysler. Uh, when Pete Rozelle was commissioner, he lived up the road from me, about six, seven miles. And um, when he was a commissioner between 1960 and 1987, uh, or 89 rather, um, Pete would uh, have a uh, chauffeur who would pick him up in a Ford station wagon and drive him to Manhattan. Chrysler was the big money behind the AFL. CBS against NBC, uh, David Sarnoff and NBC had been smarting for years and years and years because... Uh, CBS, Paley took Jack Benny from him and Burns and Allen and others in a raid of NBC's radio talent in 1948. Paley got the NFL in 1962. He got the AFL again, NFL again in 1964. So there was a big rivalry between those two. The NFL establishment sports writers like Sports Illustrated's Tech Small, who never could write anything positive about the AFL, against uh, the uh, AFL announcer and also the NBC announcer uh, for Major League Baseball and also the Boston Red Sox announcer, Kirk Gowdy. Just wasn't a game. That would all subside in due time. Tech Schramm again. Tech's 
yeah, sometimes Tex said things that were wrong, and sometimes he said things that were right. More often, he said things that were wrong, at least to me. Uh, the Super Bowl kind of put the icing on the cake, and interest in the National Football League kept rolling until it was the most popular spectator sport in the United States. Well, the Super Bowl didn't do that. The Harris Poll, 1965, indicated football was more popular than baseball. And by the time January 15, 1967 rolled around, football was firmly ensconced as the most popular sport in America. Some people, no, it wasn't some people, it was one person, Al Davis, began calling the American Football League, National Football League, World Championship game, the Super Bowl, in 1968. Davis's Raiders played in uh, the game in Miami, which was still called the American Football League, National Football League, World Championship game. Uh, Oakland would lose to Green Bay in that game. Uh, no one could ever think of a proper name. I was talking to Pete Rozelle all those years ago, and uh, we're talking about the name. And uh, he says, you know, I thought Lamar Hunt's idea of calling the Super Bowl was corny. And I looked at Pete, I said, corny? Yeah, he's corny. I said, I haven't used that since I'm 12 years old. That was in 1968. Nobody says corny anymore. He said, you know, it's like super duper. When we were growing up, everything was super duper or razzle dazzle. And I kept, corny? You sure, corny? And um, so, you know, Roselle Sow was born in 1926. What do you want from me? Uh, the origins of the name. July 25th, 1966, Lamar Hunt wrote a letter to Roselle. I have kiddingly called it the Super Bowl, which obviously can be approved upon. Hmm. Can it be approved upon? Let's think about that. Can it be approved upon? It was one of the spur of the moment things said Lamar to me back in uh, the late 1990s, we're in Palm Springs in an NFL owners meeting. No one ever said what we're going to call it. It was just one of those things that came out of the mouth. It wasn't too inspired. Hmm. Or was it? Uh, I was born in 1956. In 1964, I get this toy, this great toy. It cost about 19 cents. It was a ball that you just threw all over the place, all over the place. And you chase it. And it bounced wacky and all that other stuff. And, you know, I, I didn't come from a rich background. I was living in Woodside, Queens in 1964. Certainly I wasn't rich. But Lamar Hunt probably lived in a mansion somewhere outside of Dallas, Texas. And he had a son by the name of Clark, who now owns the Kansas City Chiefs. Well, let's get back to, uh, to Lamar. So Lamar is home one day, and he's watching his children play with a ball when he first uttered the words. They each had a Super Bowl that my wife had given to them. And they were always talking about them. And I just used the expression Super Bowl. Super Bowl, rather. It was an accidental thing. Hmm. She wasn't too inspired, was it? There it is. Mine was blue. I don't know what Clark's was. I know what my friends, some of them had green, some of them had yellow. It was a 19 cent ball that bounced and bounced and bounced. Whammo Super Bowl. It's shelf life considerably less than the Super Bowl. It was a toy made at Zectron, a chemical engineer by the name of Norman Stingley, found that when formed at 50,000 pounds of pressure, Zectron becomes uncontrollably bouncy. Whammo began producing a ball made of Zectron in 1964. I'm eight years old. I'm watching Channel 5 in New York. I'm watching Channel 11 in New York because they have the cartoons, they have Soupy Sales and others on those shows. And we would see Whammo commercials about the Super Bowl. And the Whammo commercials were great because they said it was double top secret, double top secret formula. But it really wasn't a double top secret as we found out. Everybody knew what it was. And uh, Whammo's competitors copied it and eventually flooded the market and the Super Bowl floundered. It lasted 12 years, gone by 1976. Broadway, Joe Namath. That's me on the right with the paper in my hand. That's Bruce, my buddy Bruce, who sometimes comes on with me on these talks. He's not too far from you in Denver. And uh, behind um, Joe is Weeb Eubank, who won probably, the, arguably, the two most important games in NFL history. The 1958 uh, uh, game between the Baltimore Colts and the New York Giants, Colts winning 23-17. 
and that lit the fuse for football's popularity, got the idea in Lamar Hunt's head, if I can't get a team in the NFL, I'm going to form an AFL, American Football League. And, of course, they won Super Bowl three behind Joe Namath against Baltimore 16-7. to seven. And this is Wingfoot Golf Course, 1988, the 20th anniversary of the Jets winning. And Bruce and I are talking about what happened, along with that guy from the Newark Star-Ledger, about what happened that day, June, January 12, 1969. Lou Michaels was a player with the Baltimore Colts. And history is not written by losers. Because it, if it was, there'd be some interesting stories here. Lou Michaels' brother, Walt Michaels, was the New York Jets defensive coordinator back then. Lou was the kicker on Baltimore. And on January 5th, Joe and Lou crossed paths at a bar in Fort Lauderdale. And Lou tells me, Joe walks in, he spots him with Jim Hudson. They walk out and Joe comes back in and it's like a Muhammad Ali entrance. It's like a pro wrestling entrance showman. Lou. I must say, Joe is a very cocky individual. I never expected that from Joe when he walked into the place. He had a fur coat on. I'll never forget it. Fur coat, Miami. He points over to me instead of saying, hi, I'm Joe Namath. I thought he was going to introduce himself to me and say hello. He points over to me and says, we're going to kick out of you, and I'm going to do it. Joe told everybody that the Jets were going to win. He said the Jets, that the AFL had better quarterbacks, whether it was Daryl LaMonica in Oakland, uh, whether it was John Hadle in San Diego, Lenny Dawson uh, in Kansas City. Denver never had a regular, really good regular quarterback after Tripuka until Craig Morton got there. Um, but um, anyway, so he said there were teams in his mind that could beat Baltimore in the AFL. And here's a news conference. Can you imagine Tom Brady laying in a chaise lounge talking to people on Clearwater Beach today? Don't think so. But, you know, a lot of New Yorkers go down to Miami in January and February because that's what we do here in New York. We get out of the uh, cold weather for a little while. This is a news conference featuring Joe Namath on the beach. Fort Lauderdale, there's Paul Zimmerman, who ended up with Sports Illustrated, Larry Fox is there, and a whole bunch of others. And there are two women. I could just imagine the conversation between these two women. Gerby, is that him? Sylvia, I don't know. Let's walk over there. Okay, we'll walk over there. Is that you? Are you Joe? Yes, I'm Joe, and we're going to win the game. Oh, wait till I tell the girls back in the Bronx that we saw you. Oh, they'll never believe us. They'll never believe us. Well, they would because that picture was in every newspaper in New York the next day. So uh, uh, Gertie and Sylvia had no problems verifying the fact that they were asking Joe Damon whether or not the Jets were going to win. That guy back there probably worked in the garment district because he doesn't care. And that woman over there, she doesn't care either. But this was what the Super Bowl was. It was a step above semi-pro back in the day. Uh, the game, Namath and the Jets win 16-7. to It is the turning point. Joe guaranteed the Jets would win. He delivered. But more importantly, because of Namath and the change, Super Bowl three, the name, the Super Bowl takes on a brand new life and becomes important in American society. Joe Namath is probably in the Hall of Fame for one game. He won that game. It's the most important game for the NFL in American culture because with that game, American culture changes and accepts the Super Bowl. Now, today the Super Bowl in non-COVID days is a big deal. There are parties, all kinds of things that are going on. People watch commercials, all that other stuff. Uh, you can get tickets to that game up to kickoff, 4 o'clock, tw January 12, 1969. Flimsy pregame show featuring a marching band. The Apollo 8 astronauts, Frank Borman, William Anders, Tom Hanks, rather Jim Lovell, Tom Hanks played Lovell in Apollo 13, had just circled the moon two weeks earlier. They lead the crowd in a rousing rendition of the Pledge of Allegiance. The national anthem performed by a trumpet player from the Washington Symphony, Lloyd Geisler. The Florida A&M University Marching Band performs the halftime show. The Jets forgot the trophy. They left the trophy behind in the Orange Bowl. But again, history is not written by the losers because sometimes the losers have interesting stories. Lou Michaels gets trashed by Namath in the bar. 
his team loses 16 to 7. Oh, yeah, and there's one more thing. He makes a bet with his brother, Walt, the defensive coordinator with the Jets. And um, the base pay for the Super Bowl was $8,000 per player. The winners got $5,000. So the Michael brothers make a bet. Whoever wins that $5,000, the church in Swearsville, Pennsylvania, needs some upgrades. And we went to that church in the 1940s and 50s. And the Padre is a nice guy. He's getting a little older. But let's help out the Padre. We'll give him the $5,000 and let him fix up the place. Well, Jets win. Michaels runs back. Walt Michaels runs back, hangs up all kind of Jets flags and stuff throughout the town. Uh, and it comes to Lou Michaels' attention that the $5,000 did not go to the church. Well, Walt decides to renege on the bet. Lou, out of his $8,000, takes $5,000, gives it to the Padre. But Michaels' brothers didn't speak for a long time after this. Lou Michaels was the ultimate loser in the ultimate game that would change culture in America. The Jets' victory, arguably the most important win in the NFL history. Roselle once told me, he said, I couldn't stand it, but I realized, hey, wait a minute. This is a great opportunity for us to really solidify this thing, which was on shaky ground. Uh, it put the AFL on par with the established league. The NFL became a hot property. The Super Bowl would go on to become a national holiday an obsession. The most watched TV event of the year in the United States, about 140 million people watch it. Pales in comparison to India, Pakistan cricket, that's 600,000 people watching that, 600 million rather, 600 million people watching that, only 140 million watching the Super Bowl. Lou, uh, Lou Michaels had no idea that that chance ballroom showdown with Namath, January 5th, 1969, would lay the foundation in turning the Super Bowl into a national obsession. There's Mahomes, Pat Mahomes from last year, and there's Andy Reid from last year, uh, the Kansas City coach taking the Super Bowl trophy, the trophy Vince Lombardi never won. It was named after Lombardi in 1970. The league named the trophy after he passed away from cancer. What you might not know about Vince Lombardi, he was a civil rights pioneer. By 1967, Green Bay had 13 black athletes on the roster, including all pros, Willie Davis, Willie Wood, Dave Robinson, Herb Adderley, and Bob Jeter. He had gay players on his team as, as well. His brother, Tom, a priest, was gay. The Queen Mary. I spoke on that cruise ship behind the Queen Mary, the princess uh, ship there. That's in San Pedro, California, Long Beach. And that is where more Super Bowl culture is created because as my friend Shelley Saltman, who promoted the uh, Ali Frazier fight in 19... Uh, 71 and would promote the battle of the sexes between Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs in 1973 and Evil Knievel's promoter in 1974. Evil Knievel beat him up. Uh, but anyway, he passed away two years ago. We were talking about the Queen Mary. Uh, he was there. Uh, the Super Bowl takes on the new personality, Super Bowl VII, a party on the Queen Mary in Long Beach, becomes a social event January of 73. As Shelley told me, anybody who's anybody was there uh, if they were in town, Dean Martin and others. And it gets out, word gets out, there's a big party and other people have parties in the parties start. And it is party time and that's John Madden. We worked together on a syndicated radio show for 15 years. That's my friend Dennis Steele on the right, Sync Sound 1998 uh, on 10th Avenue, 56th Street, Manhattan. And, uh, well, you know, it's party time. Party time, so let's do it John style. Hey, you got your burgers there, and, and you got your wings there, and you got, your, you got your dip there, and you got your dogs there. You got the cups, so you have something to drink. You have some silverware there. You got some cake there. Hey, and there's some popcorn there. And, hey, ketchup, ketchup and mustard. Where's the white rye bread? Can't have a party without ketchup, mustard, and rye bread because that's my favorite sandwich. Yeah, it's party time, uh, and, and John would like that spread, except uh, there's no rye bread there, so he couldn't have his favorite sandwich, uh, ketchup and mustard on rye. Um, Super Bowl parties in the economy. Every community in America is touched by the Super Bowl. Uh, stores have big screen TVs on sale. My wife uh, was looking at her phone the other day and went to the Costco thing, and they said big screen TVs for the big game. Uh, supermarkets have super sales, the Beer Institute. There is a Beer Institute. Lori Levy was the lobbyist. We went out uh, for lunch one day and she told me all about what the Beer Institute does and how big a party day the Super Bowl is. Second biggest food consumption day of the year 
behind Thanksgiving, normal years. Uh, TVs, the big old screen TVs. Hey, this week they're all on sale. Go get one and it'll be installed with a big game. According to the National Electronic Dealers Association, sales of large screen TVs increase 500% during Super Bowl week because the event increases demand for television sets to watch the big game. Beer here, beer here. The Beer Institute has data that suggests the Super Bowl is one of the seven biggest sales days of the year behind Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's Eve, 4th of July. Some years it's higher than the others. In fact, now the Super Bowl parties are bigger than the New Year's Eve parties. The big game in you. Newspaper sells advertisements for special Super Bowl sections. The Super Bowl is a moneymaker for supermarkets, department stores, bars, snack food makers, breweries, restaurants. It's also the springboard for companies to start their annual TV, radio, print advertising campaigns. The actual game may take second place to everything else going around the Super Bowl. And rating TV commercials is a major part of the package. In fact, the other day, uh, two of the advertisers uh, previewed their commercials for TV critics. It's also on NFL.com, a circle, a loop of TV commercials. The most famous commercial remains the one that was done down the street here in the Mount Vernon Stadium, which is now God being replaced. It's Mean Joe Green from Pittsburgh and the kid with the Coca-Cola who uh, says, here, here, here's Coca-Cola. Still the number one commercial. Oh, Joe Namath after the Super Bowl. Oh, he did well, did really well. Did Knox Zimmer commercial with uh, Farrah Fawcett. Uh, did uh, a TV show, a series with uh, Dick Schaap and Larissa Moritz and uh, also did movies with people like uh, Raquel Welsh. So he did kind of well. He also did a pantyhose commercial, Hanes Pantyhose, back in the mid-1970s. Hey, Joe loved wearing the pantyhose underneath his football uniform, so it made him feel good. And some women over the years have said to me, why are you just showing that? Why don't you show something like him wearing the pantyhose? And I said, does that make you happy? Yeah, it did. Today, Joe is pitching Medicare coverage helpline. I'm happy I called. Uh, Jimmy Walsh, his agent since 1964, still has him out there pitching stuff. Joe's going to be 78 in May, and he's pitching Medicare coverage helpline additional insurance. Joe today. Uh, some of the best of the commercials, the Coke commercial with Mean Joe Green, the Apple Sledgehammer commercial for computers in 84, Pepsi, the Coke guy takes a Pepsi in 96, Tabasco sauce in 98, 3D Doritos in 98, Budweiser, the Clydesdales, you will not be seeing Clydesdales this weekend, the first time in 37 years, there will be no Budweiser spots, uh, they're putting their money in COVID-19 uh, education forums. Uh, Reebok, Terry Tate office linebacker, and Betty White, who last week celebrated her 99th birthday. When she was a mere child of 88, she and Abe Vigoda were in a Snickers commercial. The Arizona problem, back to politics for the NFL. Bill Bidwell moved the St. Louis Cardinals to uh, Phoenix, Tempe, Arizona in 1988. And he gets there and he's in the middle of a political fight over Martin Luther King Day. The NFL awarded Bidwell's Cardinals the 1993 Super Bowl in an effort to boost sagging attendance in Tempe uh, in March of 1990. Uh, the theory was more people would buy tickets because they would be put in a lottery to get Super Bowl tickets for 1993. There is a problem. Ronald Reagan uh, signs into law of Martin Luther King Day in the 1980s. The Arizona governor, Bruce Babbitt, in 1986. Um, Governor's executive order makes it a holiday in Arizona, but uh, the new governor that came in, Evan Meacham, cancels the Martin Luther King holiday in 1987. Bidwell takes the team to Tempe in 1988, and this stuff is all going around him at that point. Uh, the performer Stevie Wonder said he's boycotting performances in Arizona. The convention planners say, we're not going. The battle is on. In 1989, the Arizona legislature passed legislation that would make the King holiday uh, a holiday in Arizona. But opponents managed to get enough signatures on the petition to have the voters decide in November 1990 whether or not to honor King. 
And basically the NFL said this, you vote for the King holiday, you got the 93 game. You vote against it, we're pulling the game. Well, the Arizona voters overturned the legislature's decision. The NFL pulls Super Bowl 27 now, but it comes back around in two years, the presidential election, Clinton, Perot, and Bush. And uh, the question comes up again, uh, should we or should we not celebrate Martin Luther King Day? Uh, the NFL gets involved and says, hey, you vote for this, we give you the next available game in 1996. You don't vote for this, you'll never get a game again. Voters voted for the Martin Luther King holiday in 92. And in March of 93, the NFL said, here you go, 1996 big game, all yours, Tempe. The anthem, I don't know if you remember this anthem or not, Whitney Houston, the Super Bowl of 1991, the Giants in Tampa, uh, Giants in Tampa against the Buffalo Bills. The game the Giants won when Scott Norwood blew a field goal. Uh, was this real or was this on tape? This is the anthem that everybody looks up to as the best anthem ever done. Jim Steig is an old buddy of mine. He ran the Super Bowl, uh, Super Bowl event. Uh, in early January 1991, our coordinator of the Super Bowl pregame activities, Bob Best, produced a recording of the Florida Orchestra for the national anthem producer, Ricky Minor. A week later, Minor flew to Los Angeles to have Whitney record the vocal track. Amazingly, done in one take. 2004, down in Houston, the New England Patriots beat the Carolina Panthers 32-29. I'm sure you all remember New England won that game. Uh, that was in Houston. Um, anyway, this is the custom malfunction, which is what that day or that Super Bowl is remembered for. Janet Jackson's custom malfunction, halftime of the 2004 game, causes a political football and changes how TV and radio present programming. ABC's Easter 2004 showing of Saving Brian, Private Ryan is impacted. After the Super Bowl incident, Michael Powell and the FCC dug in and started to go after other areas of indecency, like hockey games. By October, Powell and his FCC colleagues was thinking, is a hockey game that features fights suitable programming between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. daily. Um, well, you know, there's a fight on, well, there are five fights on every play in football, the offensive linemen and defenders, but it's football. Uh, they didn't act on that. The FCC would act. Justin Timberlake grabbed Jackson in the dance routine, accidentally forcing her dress to open, which revealed one of her breasts. That nine sixteenths of a second left an impression but it's faster than the blink of the eye. So how did it leave the impression? Well, people were on social media, not Facebook, not Twitter back in those days, AOL, instant message, uh, messages, um, Yahoo Messenger, whatever Hotmail had at the time. And people start saying, hey, do you see what I saw at halftime? No, do you have TiVo? Yes. Well, if you have TiVo, go back to halftime and then slow it down, slow it down, slow it down. And voila, there it is, there's the frame, there it is in her glory. Uh, and people start talking on social media about that. And it catches on like wildfire, which meant that uh, Facebook and, and, and Twitter really had uh, their test probe with AOL Instant Messenger back in those days. Politicians immediately derided Viacom, CBS, and the Viacom CBS MTV unit, which produced the halftime show. Within 15 hours, politicians gathered on the steps of the Capitol in Washington, pointing their finger at Jackson. Not at Timberlake, but at Jackson. She did something immoral, and CBS promoted something immoral. The hammer would come down in CBS, the Republican FCC majority, who's ever in the White House, Republican or Democrat, they control, they have the majority control of the FCC. This time it was Republicans. Uh, the FCC majority got involved, fined Viacom, CBS $550,000, change in decency rules. Viacom, CBS fought the fines for seven years and won. They paid more for lawyers' fees, but that's the principle. Saving Private Ryan, a Steven Spielberg, a Steven Spielberg film starring Tom Hanks. Saving Private Ryan, Edward Burns, Matt Damon, Tom Sizemore. The mission is a man. 
The FCC raised the amount stations and networks could be docked for what can be termed questionable images and dirty words. In 2004, television stations were scared off by the prospects of fines. 66 Disney ABC TV affiliates, mostly in the southern United States, did not show the movie Saving Private Ryan because of language concerns. They didn't want to risk the fines, or the station owners didn't want to risk the fines. Saving Private Ryan had won five Academy Awards following the release in 1998. It had appeared on ABC Easter 2001, Easter 2002. Military veterans groups were furious with the stations. Disney ABC said, we'll pay the fines, just show it. Uh, but they did it. The FCC in the prior two showings had one foul language complaint about the movie in 2002 and ignored it. So the NFL goes to safe acts for the halftime show. Paul McCartney, who was busted in 1980 in Tokyo uh, for pot and uh, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which was acid fueled, deemed a safe act by 2005. The Rolling Stones, safe act, 2006. Keith Richards. Uh, two of the four members of the Who died from drug complications. John Whist uh, Entwistle, the bass player from Cocaine. Keith Moon, the drummer from uh, taking prescription drugs to help control his weight, but he was also a junkie at the time. That's uh, Ringo Starr's son, uh, Zach Starkey, who's on the drums, Roger Daughtry and Pete Townsend. It's more than a game. $13 million of free advertising, it's estimated, for a performer uh, performing the Super Bowl halftime show. Bruce Springsteen's done it. Mariah Carey, Michael Jackson, uh, Madonna, Prince, Justin Timberlake, twice Beyonce, Janet Jackson, McCartney, The Stones, The Who, Whitney Houston, Lady Gaga have all been part of either the pregame show or the halftime ceremonies. You will never again see Up With People doing a Super Bowl halftime show. Tampa gets the game on Sunday, Englewood, California in a year, Glendale, Arizona in 2023. New Orleans is scheduled to get the game in 2024, but you know what? It's up against Mardi Gras. And even the NFL knows if it comes to Mardi Gras or the Super Bowl, Mardi Gras is going to win. So they're going to probably push that game back to 2025. Las Vegas may slide in in 2024. My wife on the field, Orange Bowl, which is no longer there, Joe is still around, where the NFL and American culture changed in 1969 with the Jets' victory, and it was Namath coming through that end zone into the shoot uh, with his number one finger up like that. That changed American culture. Today, the NFL puts the game out for bid. If a committee says we're interested, they go talk to them to see if they really are interested. The game is shown in February. It's one of three major waiting periods for networks, and the networks that get, or the network, this case CBS, gets the Super Bowl, wins the rating sweep, and CBS's affiliates will get to charge higher uh, advertising rates for the next three months. Um, London may end up getting a Super Bowl. Nah, I don't think so. Congress created the Super Bowl, take it away. NFL has embraced Las Vegas after years of being against legalized gambling. Well, um, gambling is one of the NFL owner's best friends now. It makes them money. Uh, Las Vegas is a Super Bowl contender. A number of years ago, the Las Vegas uh, Visitors and Bureaus Convention Bureau decided they wanted to take out the dad on the Super Bowl. The NFL said, no, we don't do gambling. That's changed. Oh, some of the facts and figures here. Uh, tickets to the 2021 Super Bowl start, $5,900. The average ticket price for the last five, 5706 bucks. $5.5 million, the average cost of a commercial during the Super Bowl. COVID-19 has flattened that cost a bit. The Super Bowl betting early estimates, $300 million, probably more. There are more legalized betting states online. Last year was $275 million. Uh, about 1.4 billion chicken wings could be eaten, depending on who goes to COVID parties this weekend. 11.2 uh, pounds of chips, 8 million pounds of guacamole, 10 million pounds of ribs. Pizza consumption up by 67%. One in two people say they would sacrifice their vacation day to watch their team win the Super Bowl. And more than one in three would give up their annual bonus. Super Bowl, much more a game than a game. A political force, an event, a happening. 
a place where people get together. I want to thank Donna for inviting me, and I want to thank everybody else uh, who uh, put up with me for the last hour and 10, 15 minutes. Any questions, any comments, the floor is all yours. Uh, I am going to stop recording now so we can put uh, faces on and um, I could shut down the, um, the uh, PowerPoint. So again, thank you, Donna, for inviting me, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, my name is Evan Weiner. Any questions or comments or criticisms, I'm all ears.